Hey, futurist uh, Jim Carroll uh, from the virtual home broadcast studio. And I want to talk about reinvention. And you know that my theme for a long time has been that the future belongs to those who are vast. And I actually found myself uh, over a 25 year, year career appearing on some absolutely fantastic stages uh, in Las Vegas and Phoenix and Palm Springs and Morocco and Tokyo and Muscat Oman and Dubai. The thing is, many of these events, I mean, I always had the pinch me moments before I would go on stage and I would film a little clip talking about the awesome production that was put in place. The people who did all of this work to build uh, the entire event are known as event professionals. And so while I had these big glorious stages uh, around the world, when COVID hit, I had to go and build my own stage uh, in my basement. I've had to reinvent to align to the reality of a world which is very different. And I'm going to go back uh, onto my stage and tell you about the story of reinvention and what happens in a world in which we need to challenge our assumptions as to what we need to do to align to a new reality. And that brings me to the event professional. These individuals spent a tremendous amount of time developing careers with massive logistics, math, massive capabilities, uh, insight to run the large scale events that you used to go to in your previous COVID life. Uh, when I would appear on stage, everything worked. When I would appear on stage, uh, everything was ticking along in perfect fashion. When uh, I would go into the event, I would see these stages that were conceived by these event professionals. They did it all. They did everything uh, that involved the production of trade shows. All of those trade shows that you went behind the scenes, there was a group of professionals who are true superheroes of logistics because they pulled together absolutely wonderful capabilities. Even the travel, even the hotels, all of the things that you did to get to the event and have a remarkable experience. Uh, that was all part of what this profession has done. And when COVID came along, they too were impacted by the dramatic change that happened because obviously conferences, events, meetings around the world, they shut down, they stopped. And suddenly you had an entire group of people uh, whose universe had shifted. And, and just like me, these folks went through what I call the seven stages of economic grief. This is like what happens with bereavement. Uh, when COVID hit, you know, many of us were in the shock phase. We were in the denial phase. Uh, I decided after about a day, I was going to get to the acceptance stage. And I began focusing on what I could do to do better than these Zoom productions, which were being sent out there. Uh, because I realized that I was going to be stuck in this very unique world for quite some time to come. I started putting together a very sophisticated broadcast studio to virtualize my leadership insight and take it to the world in a different fashion, knowing that people were going to consume it via iPhones, via iPads, via their computers, anywhere at any time. The thing about the meeting industry is it's been really, really interesting. Look, the other day I actually built myself a spaceship because I had a news interview and I thought, what the heck, I'm going to do it inside a spaceship. Uh, that brings me to Beth Cooper Zabit. Uh, she's a meeting professional and uh, one day I saw a post that she had on Facebook which talked about the reality of her reinvention and the enthusiasm that she was bringing to her role. Look at that smile. That defines optimism. That defines where we can go in our future if we are of the right mindset. And when I read her post, it was actually quite remarkable because she, like many in her field, was busy finding a new career, finding new responsibilities, finding new opportunities she refused to stand still. And we're going to talk to Beth shortly about the reinvention process that she went through uh, to get her there. It was actually based upon an article that she saw on another meeting professional site uh, that was titled, Normal is Overrated for Now. And I want um, you to read the words that Beth wrote when she had this very excited uh, Facebook and LinkedIn message that announced her new position. I'm looking forward to stretching my comfort zone, learning from others in operating from a growth mindset instead of looking back to what I was previously doing in my career. And here's the thing, what I've discovered in this industry, there's a lot of event professionals who are of the mindset, I just wish we could go back to where we were. I just wish we could go back to organizing these big Las Vegas events. We know we're gonna be in this space for quite some time to come. And that's where Beth's mindset that I've gotta reinvent myself for a very different future 
is absolutely critical. The article that she was referring to is a very powerful read. And when I blog this, I'm going to put up a link to it. Uh, it included the comment, for example, you cannot find your way forward if you are constantly looking backward. It, it made the reference that the stress of clinging to a past normal will break you. If you spend too much time thinking about where you've been rather than where you can go, you're not in the right headspace. And so when I read Beth's comments, this appealed to me because everything I've talked about revolves around optimism. Uh, I've taken a lot of my stage presentations over the years and I've wrapped optimism quotes around them. Never underestimate the ability of those around you to try to destroy your optimism. There are few um, commodities in the world more precious right now than hope and optimism. When COVID hit, I ran down to my broadcast studio and I put out you know, this quote, life is 98% capitalizing on your optimism and just 2% managing your brief moments of panic. Uh, you know, everything I do involves the concept of what do we do to align ourselves to opportunity, and that's where we'll catch up with Beth. Uh, I brought her in uh, via my green screen studio, and the real fun thing is about two minutes before we went live, my microphone lavalier battery died for the second time. Uh, I've gone to plan B. This is what event planners do. What's a good stage presentation without a small uh, bit of challenge at the start? Welcome, Beth. Thanks, Jim. So glad to be here. Tell me about optimism. How, do, how does this define you? How does, how does optimism define what you do and how you think? Well, you know, being a professional meeting and event planner, I think we're natural born optimists. You know, we have to be. There's so much that's out of our control at a meeting or an event. You know, anything could happen. You know, we become so used to be able, being able to spin any kind of situation. You know, an elephant crashes your ballroom. Hey, it's a team building. You know, we can we can do anything, you know. So um, when when COVID hit, I had been with my company for 22 years and um, you know, was in a really good place um, creating um, super events for our, um, for our customers, our internal stakeholders. And then all of a sudden, like you said, everything was shut down. So I was able to pivot for a while within my organization doing other things that I was good at. But um, you know, eventually my company decided that, yeah, we don't need a meeting and event planner because we're just not holding meetings and events. So after 22 years on the exact 22, 22nd anniversary of my hiring date, my position was eliminated and I was gone. Um, you know, I have to say it, it, it struck my ego a little bit. I felt a little resentful. I felt sad for all the, you know, people that I was leaving. That lasted about a week. And then I just realized, you know what, let's get moving. Let's start doing things that are going to make me marketable, make me relevant and keep me connected with all the people in our great industry. So that's exactly what I did. Signed up for classes, started networking with my peers, really started getting into LinkedIn and Facebook and expanding my, my networking capabilities because I, I came to realize I'm not the only one in this situation. There's nothing to be ashamed of. This happened to me, and but it's only going to be me who's able to get out of the situation. And, and that's just the mindset I took. So, so how long do you think you were in the, in the, the you know, those early stages of the seven stages of, of economic grief, uh, like a week or two? Did you? Yeah, you know, a, a few weeks because I found out on January 1st and then was doing all the, you know, closing up of business, you know, transferring computer files, all that kind of junk back to my company. So that took two weeks and then January or excuse me, June 15th. It was it was gone. And in fact, on June 15th, I started a class through the event leadership um, event leadership called um, Virtual Event and Meeting Management with Brant Kruger. That introduced me to a cohort group of 400 people who were all learning about virtual events and how the industry was going to evolve. So that provided me with great up to the minute education, a great uh, networking group that I could bounce ideas off of, that I could connect with, that I could learn from. And that really gave my day structure because I was able to take classes, network with people, get great ideas from them, um, you know, go to the live class. And that really helped me out and kept me focused. So, so reinvention to you wasn't just the optimism, which came through in that original LinkedIn post. And when I read that, I was like, whoa, this is it right here. 
but it's also reskilling, new knowledge. If I'm going to reinvent myself, not only do I have to have the optimism to get there, but I'm going to educate. I, I'm going to learn what I don't know, uh, and then I'm going to explore, uh, you know, different career, different mindset, different opportunities. Did did you were you one of these event planners that was sort of clinging to the mindset though that you know, look, we're going to be back to Vegas soon, uh, we're going to be meeting in person soon, or did you sort of decide early on that wow, this is bigger than I thought, and uh, we've really aligned to. Uh, the reality of this. Yeah, you know, I kind of think that um, that virtual and hybrid are never going to go away. You know, a lot of planners are thinking, oh, we're just going to go back to live events. People are going to be, there's going to be this pent up desire to travel. Everybody's going to want to get together. But I don't really feel that way. I really feel as though now that, you know, the whole world knows that things can be successfully and creatively done virtually, there's always going to be those people in our organizations that can't travel, whether it's because they're, you know, in a pregnancy, maybe they have childcare issues, maybe they have elder care issues that don't allow them to take a week out of their schedule to go someplace else. And so they're going to say to their companies, you know what, you've been able to provide virtual um, events for the last year. Why can't you do that for going forward so that I can still participate fully despite my personal circumstances? So I don't think virtual or hybrid is ever going to go away. I think they're going to be a great partner to live events. Do, do you worry about some of your peers still in the industry? Do you see some folks who are sort of stuck in that anger and denial and depression and bargaining? Not really getting to that acceptance phase and, and therefore they're, they're not really inventing for the future? They're you're sort of stuck in where they were yesterday. Yeah, you know, but I feel like we need to approach our colleagues with grace. You know, everybody's walking in a different mindset. Everybody's got a different educational background, a different work um, background. You know, some people um, might be thinking and praying that live events come back because that's what they know. Maybe we just need to give them a little bit more time. You know, there's always a group of people who are early adopters. And, you know, that they're just, you know, jumping in gung ho, kind of being trailblazers and everybody follows in their wake. So I really feel like we need to offer some grace to those people that um, still might be thinking, you know, I want to stick with what I know. You know, maybe they don't have the resources to, you know, jump into classes or, you know, or do a a totally different career shift. Um, So let's help them along. Let's help them see that virtual and hybrid isn't as scary as they might think it is. And those of us who um, are a little bit um, more trained in that area, let's bring them along so that we can keep our industry whole. So, So tell me about the industry buzz though. As I see it, the industry buzz is, you know, there's a lot of articles about just put a lot of buckets of hand sanitizer about, we'll, we'll get back. And uh, I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of discussion of how do you do great virtual? How do you design great virtual sets? How do you design an event that isn't one of these sort of second life-ish 19, uh, 2008 uh, style set that Joan saw and, and Dan Parks and I did in Virtualis, you know, 12 years ago. How do we move the industry forward in terms of the concept of reinvention? What, what's, what's going wrong and what, what does the industry need to do? Yeah, well, you know, a great point about that, but I really think that the skills that um, meeting and event planners already have from live events will do them, um, you know, will stand them in good stead um, going forward because the same qualities are needed. You need creativity to do a virtual event so that it's not just something that, you know, wah, wah, everybody shows up for, nobody's engaged in. Engagement is key. You know, everybody used to say content was key, but content is a dime a dozen right now. You've got to do stuff more in with the attitude of like a TV show rather than um, a stage play. You've got to keep things moving. You've got to ask people, you know, polling questions. You need to get them involved in networking. You need to provide um, great visuals. You need to provide content, of course, but how do you keep them in front of their screen? How do you keep them not distracted from their kids who are schooling at home or UPS showing up at the door or their dog barking or, you know, the 10,000 other things that are grabbing their attention. So engagement is key. And part of that is going out to your um, participants and saying, what is going to draw you to this? What is going to keep your attention? What do you want to focus on rather than just assuming you know what your meeting participants want? Yeah, before before COVID hit, I, I would talk at a lot of retail conferences and I'd make the observation that studies have shown the typical goldfish has a longer attention span than a human. Our, our attention spans were already collapsing 
uh, before COVID. And on stage, I had to adjust my style with uh, that, that Pink Floyd song, Short, Sharp Shocks of Insight, because like it was changing. So I was already introducing a lot of text message polling and stuff. Uh, and there, there is a lot of very nifty tools in virtual. So actually, if anybody is watching right now live on LinkedIn or Facebook, uh, you could actually leave a comment. And with the infrastructure I'm using, uh, I might be able to actually see it show up here and I can add it to the broadcast. I mean, the thing is, I, I think part of the challenge that has emerged here, and look at that, there we have Gloria Nelson uh, has come right in. Um, part of the challenge here, Gloria and I go way back to the days of Virtualis in 2008. Um, people don't understand the realm of the possibility. I, I remember seeing um, one event planner who had this massive post on LinkedIn uh, back in about May saying, okay, look, I hate virtual, virtual sucks, these Zoom calls suck, it's awful. Um, I can't wait till we go back. And there was a, that was something I posted in some of the Facebook groups in which you and I hang out in. And, and I think that to me was sort of an admission of defeat. That was an admission that we weren't really spending time to understand the realm of what's possible. What have, what have you learned in your new role and your new education and your new skills in terms of the realm of the podcast? Gloria, thank you for your comment. If there's others out uh, there, just type something into the comment box and uh, we'll bring it into the conversation. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things I've learned in my new role, I'm a digital event producer for Innovaya Productions and Zen Event, a company that's based in Dallas. And, you know, they had been doing live events um, as an AVN production company really successfully, and then everything shut down. And so they were able to reinvent themselves by adopting a virtual platform that they were able to serve their customers with. And so, you know, just as an example, they had been doing live events for a pharmaceutical company where the folks were traveling across, you know, 10,000 miles, putting on, um, you know, six weeks of events for their um, customers, introducing new vaccine and new drug studies. You know, think of the um, carbon emissions that that was taking, you know, that was happening. Think of the time. Think of the travel costs. And by putting that into a virtual platform, they were able to cover 10,000 miles in four events times three days, you know, pushing um, the launch to market so much more quickly than, than what had happened in the past with live events and those educational opportunities. So just with this one client, there was over $10 million in air travel saved, 10 million um, uh, carbon emission exchanges saved. So yeah, my company, um, along with, you know, all the others out there are doing so much so creatively to help their clients where we are now. You know, one of the things I said in my, in my post was we can't be looking to the way things were because that's never going to be the same again. That era is over. So let's, you know, jump on board. Let's be supportive, eager, enthusiastic, and excited about where we're going. Well, and that's, that's the thing. I, what you were pointing out there was the need for knowledge and reacting fast and dealing with market change. So I, I spoke at a healthcare conference uh, before Christmas. And I, I you know, spoke at a tremendous number of healthcare events out in the real world. And I would often talk about how quickly medical knowledge was evolving. And uh, you know, five years ago, I'd be on stage, the volume of medical knowledge globally is now doubling every eight years. That was my old tagline. Look, it's now doubling every 76 days. What we have been through with COVID, with massive acceleration of science, uh, new methodologies, new forms of diagnosis, new, new drug tests, uh, the acceleration of genomics. I mean, the world of medical science, the volume of medical knowledge is just absolutely exploding. And, and that's where I'm a little bit confused by what the industry is doing that, well, we're gonna wait to you know, figure out how we're gonna do our in-person events again at the same time that we have this absolutely massive crying need to get um, virtual you know, insight out there and people can participate at their leisure. A fellow named Bart Blom, uh, I so agree, virtual is here to stay and making that attractive and informative will be critical. And to me, that's the key point. Look, Zoom sucked. People, you know, we, we, people rushed in and I find a lot of speakers, they put up, you know, they, they have the, you know, the standard, you know, bookshelf behind them and they're, they're trying to squeeze a PowerPoint into the side and, people are dying by Zoom. They used to die by PowerPoint. They're now dying by, by Zoom. So, you know, if we could do more in terms of stage set, stage design, is that part of your education process? Or are you learning more about, uh, you know, how to accomplish that? 
Yeah, stage set, stage design, um, you know, again, really listening to the client, you know, they're um, their big concern is, you know, how are we engaging our, our participants? So we're offering opportunities to them like um, live rock bands. You know, maybe they couldn't take their whole uh, group to someplace to a live rock band concert because they didn't have the budget for that. But we're bringing bands to them. We're bringing karaoke. We're bringing escape rooms. We're bringing um, gift boxes to everyone, um, you know, with food and beverage. And we're trying fun wine tastings. You know, there's so many things things that you can do that really the sky's the limit. You know, um, one other place that I've really gotten a lot of good information from is a gentleman whose name is Alex Lindsay. He's got a daily two hour talk session with people in um, AV and production um, just to kind of um, you know, talk shop and, you know, um, anybody can tune in, listen to him, ask questions. And that generosity of spirit right now, I think is amazing. Our industry is so generous with its knowledge, so generous with its experience. And there's a lot of stuff that we can grab onto and learn from. Um, it's just, like I said, the sky's the limit right now in terms of learning and growing. How, how much of your time do you think is now spent on working versus learning has the amount of time towards learning about the industry shifted that you're now spending more time in that well you know now that i'm in my new position since december 1st every day i'm learning there's so much that i don't know but i'm so lucky to have um just a great colleagues at um innovaya and zenevent who are so generous and you know stopping explaining the why behind the what of what I'm doing and you know helping me work with their clients that they've had for a while so I feel like I you know sometimes by the end of the day I'm just like woo you know <laughs> I'm I'm not only physically tired I'm mentally tired from everything I'm learning I've always loved to learn um, you know, when when COVID hit and I was in this new place that I, you know, didn't know where I was going after doing, you know, the same thing for 22 years, I started um, kind of like a positive affirmation board on my on my back door. And it just had little things like, you know, keep moving ahead, you know, Dory from Finding Nemo, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. I found a card from my mom, actually, that she had sent me, you know, 22 years ago when my last position was eliminated that said, you know, anytime that this has happened to you, you've always landed in a good place. So just trust that the same thing is going to happen this time. So I, I took that card, I put it on my desk, and it really helped me keep my spirits up. My husband was just incredibly supportive, you know, just telling me, you know what, you're going to do fine. You have great experience. You have a great education. You have a great network. You're just going to do fine. And that kind of support was just invaluable to me. And, and so I, that goes to the point I was trying to play out in my introduction to the show. And since we've got a bunch of event planners um, watching in, I will admit to two uh, challenges that occurred in the two minutes before Beth and I went live. Uh, three challenges, actually. Number one, she couldn't hear me through her headphones and I started appearing in her speakers. Then I was appearing through her speakers and not through her headphones. So we had to get through that. Number two, my lavalier mic pack, the battery died. I had it charging all morning. So guess what? I got to get a second lavalier. Redundancy uh, is critical. Uh, and the third thing is my remote um, started doing a double hit. So I don't know if you caught that in my production, but like when you're on stage in Vegas and things go wrong, you learn to manage. But what Beth was just referencing there, your, your you know, post on the back door about optimism. I've been getting up every morning for four years and doing this, you know, little motivational quote thing that I'm reminding myself of the mindset I need to be in. And I used to take a photo from the stage and I got to the point I was paying photographers, you know, on the on the event staff to, you know, send this stuff to me via Dropbox quickly because I needed good stage photos. And my studio has now become the engine of the, you know, stuff that lets me, here I am over here, um, you know, generate the material that I can, I, I can use. So, so much of this is mindset. And that's what you're referencing. If you get into the right mindset, if you get into the main right headspace, it's, it's, so important to what you do. Uh, Gloria's question here, it's the difference between corporate theater um, and it's more akin to a TV producer with production values. Do you, do you think you have that skill set yet? Are you getting there? Is that part of your discussion that you're having? Yeah, you know, I think I'm getting there. You know, that um, what Gloria um, said was, you know, really um, what we learned a lot in the virtual event and meeting management class through ELI and through Brant Kruger. Um, you know, just kind of changing our our scope from this kind of square stage 
with people pacing back and forth, you know, maybe around a theater in the round kind of setup to, um, you know, looking at looking at our events as more quick color, move on, focus, you know, it keep, you got, you've got to keep the momentum going or you're going to lose people. So um, great point by Gloria. Thanks for contributing that. Um, you know, that's what, where our mind has to be going forward when we think about our events. Let, let, let's talk about technology and I'm going to make the screen go blank here for a moment while I pull in a different camera source. I'm firing up my iPhone here. Um, to give you, because I'm making this up now as I go. The, we, we're a half hour in, it's all working, um, and nothing is blowing up, so I'm kind of uh, super enthusiastic here. So it's going to go blank for a moment, and I'm going to send you a live shot from my phone uh, as I pull up that camera source. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about technology as we go here. So if I go back, actually, that's uh, 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 an above the, uh, above the shoulder shot in my studio. If I get to the uh, iPhone shot, Tell me about the technology. Are you a techie? Is this something which is terrifying to you? Is it something you're figuring out? Uh, what's what's your technology voyage been like? And while Beth's talking, here's here's where we're coming from. This is down in my basement, you know, this studio with a whole bunch of gear. And I used to have the AV team of 30 people doing this, and it's now just me. Yeah. Great setup, Jim. It's it's amazing. You know, I, I think I checked in with you earlier this summer and you were showing me all this and I was just amazed at everything that you've been able to create. You know, I'll admit, you know, when I at my last job, I was in an office with my laptop. You know, that was about the only technology I had besides, you know, a fax machine and a photocopy machine and stuff like that. Now I'm working from, you know, two big screens um, on my desktop plus a laptop. Um, when I'm going, you know, I have my first live events that I'm running for um, clients at the end of the month. And I can imagine that I'm going to be having an open phone line, you know, to the tech side. I'm going to be having my dual screens plus my laptop. I have my own personal laptop an iPad, my um, my iPhone. So I'm sure that, you know, all of those will be working as I'm providing, you know, tech assistance to participants. I've got my meeting planner on the other line, making sure that everything's running well for her. I've got my producers on the other line that are calling the show. So, you know, I, I don't think my setup is ever going to be as cool as yours, Jim, are, but uh, it's, are, it's much different than it was a month ago. Are, are you scared though? Like the, the night before, are you going to be, uh, are you going to be uh, not sleeping or do you feel like your entire history as somebody who is a master superhero logistics gives you what you need? I mean, you just started rattling off a whole bunch of, uh, you know, checklist stuff um, that will help to get you there. Yeah, you know, but you talked earlier about redundancies. You build redundancies into the system. And the other thing is, is, you know, just from the you know month and a half or so that I've been at um, Innovaya and Zen event, my team is first rate. You know, all the all the people on the production side calling the show, I, I trust them. You know, with my life. You know, when I first started on December first, they had back to back events that were coming off at like, um, you know, midnight. American Central Time because they were doing stuff in Japan. They were doing stuff all over the world. It was all hands on deck because of their dedication to our um, clients. So me being the digital event producer, having those guys on my team, I feel great. You know, I, I every single event I've ever done my whole career, whether it was live or now, you always get that kind of rumbly in your tummy kind of feeling, you know, before you go on. I would never eat breakfast before an event just because, you know, I was kind of like all, you know, the adrenaline was hitting me. I'm sure that's how I'm going to be now. But I really feel confident that I've got a great team that I'm working with and, and we're going to do everything we have to do to be a success. We're going to do those um, rehearsals in advance. We're going to do those tech checks in advance. Um, we can't control everything, you know, the last mile between, you know, where your speaker is speaking and then all of a sudden nobody can hear him that we can't control. Um, you know, somebody, somebody's power goes out or whatever, wherever they are, we can't control that, but we can respond on the fly and we have redundancies built in. So I'm, I'm really confident in going forward that I have the, the right team, um, to help me do whatever I need to. That was like a serenity prayer moment. Let me control the things I can and, uh, you know, the ones that ones I can't. Um, but your point about yeah. attention there, surround yourself with great partners. Your ability to align yourself with good people will be the thing that will help you define what you can what you can do and accomplish. Um, Bard has another comment. I bet you I never told you, Beth, that we could do this thing of actually bringing in Q&A uh, as part of the talk. And you said you were going to relentlessly focus on the screen. So you might not have seen these questions 
uh, flowing in here. Beth has it right. The economic argument to use virtual is strong. This is the new normal work from home and me from home. Lower your, your carbon footprint. So you believe that we're going to be here for quite some time. That's been, that's been my mindset. And if we're going to do it, we might as well do it right and build ourselves, you know, fantastic sets and, you know, great technology and do something that visu- visually engages people. Uh, in, in a new and different way. My own experience, I'm, I've been forcing myself to go live every day or every second day with something simply to figure this out because it's a big difference to go from a great big stage in front of 7,000 people in Vegas to hanging out in my basement where all I've got you know behind me is this green wall. I've come to call my green wall my canvas of uh, creativity. Um, let's let's close here. If you were, if you were to offer up... Um, advice to someone on the concept of reinvention, reinventing your future. Uh, you, you've got somebody who's terrified, they don't know where to start, they're, they're worried, they're concerned, they're, they're stuck in those different phases of, of the stages of economic grief, they're not convinced they, they can do it. What's, what's your advice based on your journey in the last nine months? Well, first of all, I think pause and take a breath. Um, you know, and then start realizing for myself, that I needed to learn. There was so much I didn't know. I didn't know what other careers were out there. I didn't know what would align with my skill set. Um, start listening to other people, start reading, start being open to others. A lot of people had good, thoughtful suggestions for um, they looked at me and what they knew of me. They knew my strengths and said, you know, you might consider X, you might consider Y, you might consider Z. I knew that I wanted to stay in the hospitality industry because it really aligns with my values and my skill set. And um, I just knew that I couldn't keep doing what I had been doing previously. So being able to move into um, being a digital event producer for Zen Event and Innovia Productions has felt like such a gift. I'm learning so much every day. I'm keeping up with where our industry is going. And I just feel like if I can offer, um, you know, any kind of coaching or counseling to anyone else, I'd like to pay it forward. So many people were generous with their time. They showed such generosity of spirit toward me. I'd like to do the same for others. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. I think, uh, you know, we're all realizing that we're all in this together. Um, uh, you know, is it, the, the event industry has a whole bunch of different people, a whole bunch of different moving parts. Uh, I've come to appreciate with a, with a variety of virtual keynotes I've been doing um, the role of the event producer because I mean I, I just came off for example a three day agricultural conference so they actually did three days hundredth anniversary for a company uh, and I spent a lot of time with the it probably had four AV checks with the event team uh, and it, it is critical when you think of all the moving parts that were in a Las Vegas event and then you think of all the moving parts and how distributed it is in this world. Uh, just a massive change. So you look, it goes back to the point that when I saw your original point, um, you know, that you put up on Facebook, the enthusiasm, the smile, the optimism that was within this message. Uh, to me, that just said, you know, that's it right there. That's That defines what we need to do, uh, the pathway that we, you know, we need to be thinking about it when we go to, you know, go into the future. Uh, and, you know, this is the type of stuff that we, uh, that we need to share going forward. So Beth, this has been absolutely fantastic. A uh, huge amount of fun in the uh, two pre-minutes before we went live here, but that's all part of uh, who we are and uh, what we do. And, you know, the key thing is organizations are in a situation in which learning is what most adults will do for a living in the 21st century. And I think that's what you do. That's what I do. That's what the whole event industry does. And I think that's where we need to shift the discussion uh, we need, need to shift it to that and, you know, away from the discussion of how do we put buckets of hand sanitizer uh, around conference halls. So uh, any any closing thoughts you want to offer out? Um, I just want to say thank you, Jim, for all that you've done for our industry. You know, you responded on the fly. You started, you know, changing your operation. You started changing um, what you were doing. And you've given our industry such a gift by being a model of what we can do in order to reinvent ourselves. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And also thank you for having me. Yeah, and I'll just close. I mean, I wrote a column in successful meetings. You and I both wrote for successful meetings along the way. I wrote a column in 2002 right after 9-11 called Get Real. And you remember the buzz then that was, we were all gonna stop going to meetings, we're all gonna go virtual. And I said, it's not gonna happen um, because at the end of the day, people need to get together. People still need to get together, but this virtual thing 
uh, is it, there's no doubt um, it's going to play a massive role as we continue to go forward. So Beth, uh, this was fantastic for everybody watching. Um, we're doing our big lunch hour walk here shortly. Uh, it will be up and will live on on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and um, LinkedIn. Uh, but I'm also going to blog it and, uh, um, you know, put it in a blog post and you can access it there. So, Beth, thank you very much for the time. Huge amount of money, a very powerful insight. And uh, you know, your optimism is is absolutely wonderful. Your smile, uh, you know, I think defines our future. So uh, thank you to uh, everyone you. for uh, tuning in. Thank you. Thank you.